Okay, so we're back, and I want to look, spend this last section looking at you with how do we give our deaths away. So we looked at how aging mellows your soul, and how the aging and death process is calibrated to bring you into the realm of spirit. But now we want to turn to how do you give your death away? Now, first of all, that might sound like a curious expression. How do you give your death away? Well, I want to contextualize it. You know, anthropologists would say this. But you also get that in great mystical literature. People like John at the Cross and so on would say that there are, we have three major spiritual seasons in your life. Anthropologists would say you have three major human seasons in your life, you know. And the first season is your struggle to get your life together. And really that begins not so much at birth because the first years your parents are starting you out. But our real struggle for individuation and for our own lives begins at puberty. So puberty is designed by God and nature, and puberty has a certain violence to it. There's a certain radicalness to it, as you know if you're raising kids. One year you have this beautiful little girl or boy, the next year you have a monster in your hand, and so on. See, so, so puberty is designed by God and nature to drive you out of the house, and it does. You, know, you live at home for a while, but see, so because that's not your home, that's your parents' home. See, so you really leave home at, pure, at, at puberty, and the whole idea is you spend the next five or 10 or 15 years finding your own home. So you find a, a partner to marry, a place to live, you get an education, you get a job, and then sometime in your 20s or certainly hopefully in your 30s, you land, you're home. You know, you have your own home, you have your own husband or career and kids and so on, you're home. See, that's the struggle to get your life together. See, and then, after we get home to our own home, then you have 30, 40, 50, maybe even 60 years, which we call your years of generativity. And there your struggle is to give your life away. So that, see, um, you know, if you look at, at um, pop culture, and pop culture very much represents youth culture, you know, it's a struggle to get your life together. So all these songs about who will love me. I'm just a lonely boy. I'm looking for America. You know, see, those are wonderful. That's, that's young people. Where am I going to land? Who's going to love me? What's going to be my life? I'm searching for myself, you know. I would hope that in our 40s, 50s, and 60s, we're no longer searching for ourselves. I hope your questions are, who will love me? Who am I? Where am I going? See, then our question is, you already know who you are, is how do you give your life away, you know? How do you become a better mother, father, teacher, aunt, worker, so on? How do you do it more generously, less selflessly, and so on, more self, selflessly, and so on? See, that's the task of our generative years. How can you be more generative? Teresa of Avila, in that wonderful, in her wonderful writings, she says, I like this. She says, the, the task. She said, when you when you're in your generative years, she, you should only have one question. And it's, how can I be more helpful? Notice he doesn't say, how can I be more spiritual? How can I be more helpful? How can I do this better? How can I be a better person, a better mother, a better father, so on? Okay. See, that's the struggle to give your life away, but we don't end there. <clears throat> Beyond that, we still have to die. See, you leave home at puberty, and then you set up your own home, but this isn't your final home. Remember, Scripture says, here we don't have a lasting city. All of us still have to die. And so we have to go to another home, so we got to leave home again, and then we have to struggle to give our deaths away. See? The, the, the three things. The struggle to get your life together, the struggle to give your life away, the struggle to give your death away. Now, let me give you start with a quote from now on. You know, it's for a long time we haven't had any liter literature on this. You know, the great mystics like John of the Cross and so on, they wrote about this, and I'll go into that. That's what John of the Cross calls the dark night of the spirit, you know. But for a long time, we didn't have any literature on this, partly because we didn't need it, because people would die and, um, you know, we didn't live that long. At the time of Jesus, you know, the average lifespan was only 40 years. So Jesus died at, at 33. He'd have been getting up there, you know, and it's only... In recent years, that the lifespan has moved to 70, then to 75, then to 80, and so on. So now we just live a lot longer, and we live healthily a lot longer. 
So what's to do with these last years? I want to quote then Henry Nouwen. It's unfortunate he died so young because he was just beginning to develop a rich literature on giving your death away. So for instance, he has a wonderful book called Our Last Greatest Gift. Our Last Greatest Gift is how do you give your death to your family, to the community, to the church, to the world? But this is a quote from Our Last Greatest Gift. He says, at a certain point in our lives, the question is no longer, what can I still do so my life makes a contribution? See, that's your question right now, if you're generative. What can I still do so my life makes a contribution? Rather, the question becomes, how can I live now? You don't stop living. How can I live now so that my death will be an optimal blessing to my family, the church, and the world? My own little quote there, I say, the quip is, at some point in our life, we have to stop writing our agenda and start writing our obituary. Okay. Uh, what's our legacy? What are we leaving behind? What kind of spirit will we leave here? They give you that great quote from T.S. Eliot, which he uses as a, as a hermeneutic for so many things. He says, home is where you start from. You started from home, and then you got to another home, and now you got to start from this home, and so on. Now, there's images for the struggle, and I'm going to tease out the major one, which is the passion of Jesus, <clears throat> and then also Abraham and Sarah and their late, late life pregnancy, but mystically, this is what the great mystics call the dark night of the spirit. See, the dark night of the, the senses. In, in, in mystic literature, there's two major dark nights. Okay? The dark night is the senses, is the, the struggle to come to maturity. That's actually the struggle to get your life together. Okay? Then the dark night of the spirit is your struggle to, in latter years, and how do you give your death away? Okay? Mythically, that's to leave home again. Poetically, that's what Goethe, the great German poet, called becoming insane for the light. That's going to be the title of the book, Insane for the Light. Remember that great poem, The Holy Longing, which I stole the title from? You know, he says, earlier on in our life, you know, we're driven by this holy eros and so on. He said, but at a certain point, he says, become insane for the light. He said, you're obsessed with a higher kind of lovemaking. You're looking at the light of another world. Um, see, that's the struggle to give our death away. And we saw this morning in Hindu spirituality, that's becoming the senyasin. That is becoming the holy old beggar, or in Richard Rohr, it's becoming the holy old fool. Now, um, I want to tease this out by beginning with the primordial example. We have the example of Jesus. You know, in Christian spirituality, uh, you always, your first example always has to be Jesus. You know, what, what does Jesus say on this? Well, let me start this way. And this, this is, you know, we have the language for this. We have the iconography and so on. I don't think we always have the concept of this. So let me start this way. You know, we say that Jesus lived for us and Jesus died for us. We say Jesus gave his life for us and Jesus gave his death for us. And we make it sound as if it's the same thing. But those are two very separate movements. Quite simply put, Jesus gave his life for us through his activity, and he gave his death for us through his passivity. That, uh, you know, the, the word, the passion, we celebrate during Holy Week the passion of Jesus, okay? And we misunderstand that, or I should say we misunderstand, we don't understand it. Because we, when we say, think the passion, we think it's his suffering, and it is, but that's not what it's referring to. You know, when the reader goes up on Palm Sunday, and the reader reads it, we, we read the Passion twice, Palm Sunday and Good Friday. But on Palm Sunday, which you read one of the synoptic Passions, John's Passion, you're going to see, doesn't work so well. Because in John's Gospel, Jesus has no humanity. So he's always divine, so the Passion doesn't, has a whole different meaning, you know. See, you know, we have four Gospels, and in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they call the synoptic Gospels, they write up Jesus from the point of view of his, of his humanity. They're showing you a human Jesus who happens to be God. In John's Gospel, it's exactly the opposite. He writes up Jesus from the point of view of his divinity. He's the divine being who happens to be walking on this planet. So the passion in John's Gospel doesn't work so well because in John's Gospel, Jesus is completely in control. So see, they come to arrest him. He stands up. They all fell over. <laughs> so so you, you don't get much of a sense of the suffering Christ in there. But you get it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
So on Palm Sunday, the reader goes up, starts this way. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark or Luke. Now, we misunderstand that because we all we're going to read about his suffering, but we misunderstand it. The word passion comes from the word passio, which is the Latin for passivity. If the reader went up and read it this way, the passivity of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke or Mark, you'd get it. And every other Sunday, or today when we read the gospel, I could start to sing the activity of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. See, the gospels, the three synoptic gospels are perfectly divided into two sections. Up until Jesus is arrested in the garden, and led away, we read about Christ's activity and him giving his life for us. And then after he's arrested and he's bound and he's walked to Pilate and so on, we read about his passivity. And it's interesting in Mark's gospel, Mark is the strictest on this. Scholars will show you in Mark's gospel, before the arrest of Jesus, all the verbs about him are active verbs. He walked, he taught. He healed, he prayed, and so on. Notice no, all activity. He did it, he did it, he did it, you know. After he's arrested, they're all passive. They led him away. Pilate had him scourged. They, they, they spit on him. They made him carry the cross, and so on. Notice it's all passive, passive, passive. Really what you're, and see, and Christ gives his death for us in that passive movement. So really, in terms of a simple image, when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, they're checking him into hospice. You know, from there on, he's not doing anything anymore. Everything's being done to him. Prior to that, he was the great doer. See, Jesus gave his life for us by doing things for us. He gave his death for us, well, except by, by dying for us, but knowing dying is a passive thing. He didn't kill himself. You don't kill yourself. Somebody kills you. Okay? And you're going to see it's going to be the same with us. We give our lives to each other through our activity. We give our deaths to each other through our passivity, through what we have to absorb. I want to tell you a couple of stories to tease this out. The first one comes from Henri Nouwen. Now, Henri Nouwen tells the story. He said, one time he got called to visit a man who was in his early 60s he was dying of terminal cancer in a hospice room. In Canada, we always say palliative care. Okay. So he's, he's dying in hospice. So Henry comes in, he said, came up to the bed, the man took his hand, said, Father, you've got to help me, you've got to help me. He said, not, not with death, he said, I know I'm dying, there's nothing any doctor can do. He said, but with this, he said, you've known me. He said, I've always been a strong guy. He said, I took care of things, I took care of the company, I took care of my family, I took care of the parish, I took care of social things. He said, I was always active and in charge. He said, now I'm lying here, they got needles in me, nurses come, they bring me food, they bring me bedpans. He said, I can't do anything. I'm just so passive. I'm just lying here. So now I said, well, this is your passion. See, you gave your life for others through your activity, but now you've got to give your death through this. And he said he sat by the man's bedside, and he kept reading to him the passion, Matthew, Mark, Luke. I did it with my older brother some years ago. He was dying of cancer, and I went to see him. Talked to him for a while, and, um, and he was quite acceptance of this. He said, it's my turn. So we all have a turn. And, but I read him the passions. Passion of Mark, passion of Luke, and so on. See, you're undergoing your passion. Okay. See, Jesus is passive. Now, a couple of other stories. Um, I had an older sister, Helen, who was an Ursuline nun. She joined the convent at quite a young age, and she was a nun for more than 30 years. And then she died in her early 50s of cancer, you know. And she was an active person. My sister Helen was not a contemplative, you know. She liked doing stuff. And she was really good at doing stuff. She was really good at taking care of people's lives and so on. She took care of our family because our parents died when we were a little young and so on. She, and at the last years of her life, they had a, a boarding academy for high school kids. And she was the den mother, the dean of students, and she spent all this time taking care of all these young girls' lives. And she loved every minute of it. Then she was stricken with cancer. And during the last nine months of her life, she was bedridden. The cancer had gone into her bones, and she couldn't walk. So she was lying in bed for nine months, which is a very symbolic time. You know, nine months. That's exactly the time it takes to gestate a new life, you know. So during the last nine months of her life, she couldn't do anything. And everything had to be done for her. We had to bring her food and bedpans and so on. And uh, then she died. That's very interesting. When you look at her life, 
there were the last nine months of her life she couldn't do anything. She was passive, you know. And during 30 years of her active ministry, she did everything. But she probably gave as much to us during the last nine months of her life when she couldn't do anything than during the 30 years of her life when she did everything. Notice Jesus. We don't know a lot about Jesus' early life. We know about the last three years of his life. Okay. They estimate his ministry was three years. So during those three years, up until the last day, Jesus did stuff for people. Okay. And then during the course of kind of a day and a half, he died for us. And we say he gave more to us during that time when he couldn't give anything or do anything than during all those years when he did everything. See, it's a great mystery that in our passivity, we give deeper and more than we give in our, in our activity. One last story that I'll try to tease this out further. <clears throat> a friend of mine is a writer. And she tells us, and she comes from a very dysfunctional family, okay? And she said her dad was an alcoholic, her mother was an alcoholic for a while, but then her mother really got sober and, 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 and wonderfully sober. And, and by, by then all the kids were, there were six kids, and they were all alienated from each other and, and so on, except they weren't alienated from the mother. They had been alienated from the father and so on, and alienated from each other. <clears throat> so she said during the last 25 years of her life, her mother tried everything to reconcile the family. Every Thanksgiving and Christmas to pull the kids together, but the kids couldn't stand each other, and they couldn't be much together and so on. They'd be polite with their mother around and so on, um, but she couldn't reconcile the family. Then she died of cancer, and during the last week of her life, she was in hospice, and she was essentially unconscious, you know. But the family gathered around her, and she couldn't speak. They spoke to her and held her hand, and they weren't really sure what she was understanding. She says, you know something? family reconciled. In her dying, she was able to do what she couldn't do through 25 years of cajoling and coaxing and inviting and so on. She couldn't speak during those last week, and yet the kids gathering around her bed, they drew from her what she couldn't give them in her activity. The family's close now again. It, it took the mother's death and when she couldn't speak. You know, notice she was able to do something in her dying, in her passivity, she couldn't do in her activity. It's the same with Jesus. You know, we didn't get Jesus when he was alive. The disciples didn't understand him and so on. He died and he left the spirit. We're going to talk about the spirit in a few minutes, you know, and they got it. They got it. You know, he was able to give us something in his death and in his passivity that he couldn't give us in his activity. Now, that's an interesting mystery and a very important one. I want to point it and highlight it for a couple of other reasons. One of them is, today, our understanding of the word euthanasia. You know, whenever a society talks about euthanasia, you can be 100% sure we don't understand this. See, euthanasia is predicated on this person's no longer useful, uh, they're no longer conscious, they're suffering, so what have they got to give? And so we kill them, or they kill themselves. Uh, that's, that's a, a deep misunderstanding of the Paschal mystery and the mystery of life in general. You know, it's when we don't have something to give or seemingly that sometimes we give it the deepest of all. And not just in death. You know, every time you absorb something in a kind of a helplessness, now you're helpless and you need to absorb it, you're giving off something really deep. Or you see it too, and I quoted James Hillman this morning, he was a deep man. But he talks about with this, he said, even in families. He said, if you have a, a disabled disability person in your family, they bring something to the family that no healthy person can bring. You know, they're an incredible gift. He almost said, imagine in your family you have a Down syndrome child and your other son is playing Major League Baseball. He said, who's bringing character to the family? Well, the Major League Baseball brings some glory to your family, but not character. The Down syndrome. It bring character, you know. See, we bring character, we bring depth, we bring healing into a room by our helplessness, by our passivity, you know. See, we don't get that with euthanasia. You know, a few years ago, you're all familiar with the example, the young girl from California who was dying of terminal cancer, and she was still pretty healthy, and she went to Oregon, where it's legal, and she had this, this wonderful farewell, kind of last supper, with her family and so on, and then they, they euthanized her, you know? And, uh, you know, 
lot of division for and against this type of thing. And then somebody a few years ago wrote a wonderful article in American Magazine in which they, 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 they spoke against that. They said, you know, like, that's a misunderstanding. You say, well, what has this girl got to give still? She's dying. And this person said, well, but we can still love her. People would wash her and hold her hand and love her, and we need her for that reason. That's wonderful, but it's only half of, of, of what needs to be said. You know, we can still love her, but that, that's only, and it's not even the important half. She's giving something. She's giving something to us that she couldn't give in her life, like this mother who reconciled her family when she couldn't talk. All the years when she could talk, she couldn't get the job done. <laughs> okay. She couldn't get it done actively, passively. And there's many examples of that. A lot of families reconcile after the parents die or whatever. It takes the death of somebody and so on. See, we can give in our dying oftentimes what we can't give in our living. Um, that's, that's the great mystery, you know. See, so we need our deaths, the way we exit this planet, the way we age and die, it has to be, we have to give our passivity over in such a way that it becomes a grace. You know, one last story. Some years ago I went to see a man and he was in his 50s, dying of cancer. <clears throat> and uh, a man, a, a great fellow, um, very involved in his community, in his church, with his family, and so on. Had just had his first grandson, and so on. But he had been dying for 10 years, actually 11 years. And I went to see him. He was in hospice, palliative care. And he said, you know, he said when we got, first got sick, he said, my wife and I, we, we prayed for a miracle, said, and we got it. He said, I had the best 11 years of my life. You know, we got 11 years out of this. You know? <clears throat> he said, now I'm dying. And he said, uh, and it's lonely. He said, he used a very interesting expression. He says, um, he said, I have a wonderful wife and kids and they hold my hand every minute. And he said, but I'm a stone's throw from everybody. Remember, the, it said, Jesus in the garden, they said, Jesus withdrew a stone's throw from everybody. He said, when you're dying, he said, you're radically alone. Nobody can go in that tunnel with you. you know, said, but he said, this, I want to do this well. He said, I want to do this with courage. He said, I want to make this my last gift to my family, especially my kids. I want them to see me die with courage, with some grace. And he did. Okay. See, he, he was conscious enough of what, what he needed to say. I need to, to give my death to my kids the way I once gave my life to them. He didn't have all the terminology, but he had the idea. Now, I want to tease that out further with a powerful metaphor image in Scripture. And it's the image of Jesus dying in John's Gospel. Okay. You know, um, in the Synoptic Gospels, you know, the, 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 when they record Jesus' death, that's always a really powerful moment. Remember on Palm Sunday, they're reading the Passion, they say, and then Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And we all kneel down for a minute of silence. And that's really a powerful liturgical moment, you know. Stark, Jesus just died, we're kneeling on these tile floors and so on. And then he gets up, and then... The Synoptic Gospels say, then the curtain veil was ripped from top to bottom and there was an earthquake and the earth opened up and the graves opened up. The saints began to walk around. It's actually powerful, beautiful ap apocalyptic imagery. The curtain veil ripped from top to bottom. That wasn't, you know, now they know they've, they've done something wrong. It's an image. The curtain veil was the veil in the temple that prevented the people from seeing into the Holy of Holies. They said the way Jesus died, the way he loved in his death, it tore away the veil that you get to see in the inside of God. You get to see God's unconditional love. And that opens up the graves, you know, the earthquake. Ever since Jesus died, the graves are empty. That's why as Christians, we don't have a great cult around cemeteries. There's nobody there. <laughs> We've got tombstones and so on. You know, they're all with Jesus in Galilee. Remember in the morning of the resurrection? The women come to the tomb, and the angel says to them, why are you looking for a live person in the cemetery? He's not here. They could have angels sitting at the front of every cemetery and say, why are you looking for a live people? <laughs> They're not here. You know, Buddhists feed their dead and so on. And have to have culture. Christians have never had that. You know, just, we keep the grass cut roughly, you know, uh, because they aren't there. They're with Jesus in Galilee. The, you know, the... The resurrection opened the tombs and everybody's gone. Uh, now, John doesn't have that image. 
In fact, John doesn't record Jesus dying at all, okay? He just records that he's dead. So then you have the thing on, on the cross, and in John's gospel, he talks to his mother, and the beloved disciple under the cross, remember, he says, behold your mother, behold your son, and so on. And then, they don't say then he gave up his spirit. Then John says, at the, at the, the, when it was getting towards dark, and the Sabbath was coming, so Pilate didn't want the bodies on the cross on the Sabbath, so he sent soldiers and they, to, to make sure they were dead, and they came to the two thieves and they broke their legs to hasten their death so they died before sunrise, sunset. But when they came to Jesus, they saw he was already dead. Okay, so John doesn't say, when he died, says, they came, he was already dead. Then they pierced his side with a lance and immediately blood and water flowed out. It's a powerful text. First of all, that notice the blood and water is coming from a dead body. It's not coming from the live body of Jesus. From Jesus, death, blood, and water flow. What are blood and water? Well, you know, Roman Catholics, we've always jumped too quick. We've always said, that's the sacraments. That's baptism and the Eucharist. Kind of. <laughs> you know, after about five gyrations, you get there. But, but first of all, let, let's start with the, from the image itself. First of all, that's a birth metaphor. See, something's being born, and it's being born out of Christ's dead body. When a baby comes out of the womb, blood and water come with the baby. See, so something's being born from Christ's side, new life, blood and water, and then also refers back to the Genesis where Adam is put asleep and God takes Eve out of Adam's side. So there's a new creation emerging from Christ's dead body, and it, it symbolizes itself in blood and water. Now, what are blood and water? Blood is the life flow. When blood is flowing through you, you're alive. Blood stops flowing, you're dead. So they say, see, this is the experience of the early Christians. They experienced from Christ's death a powerful outflow of blood, of life. They felt more alive. Now, this is the incredible thing. They felt more alive than they ever felt before. And water does what? Water quenches thirst, and water washes you clean. Say, so we're washed clean in the blood of the Lamb. We're washed clear from the water of the Lamb. So the early Christians, in Christ's death, they experienced two things. They experienced a powerful inflow of life. We also talk after it's about spirit. And they experienced themselves as being cleansed and, and nurtured more than ever before, but from a dead body. Notice they didn't say, we drew this from Christ's life. We drew this from the way he was. They drew it from his death. That's why it's such a powerful image. The blood and the water flows from a dead body. Okay, now, how do you tease that out? How abstract is that, and what does it mean that blood and water flow from a dead body? Let me try to tease it out this way. If someone said to me, what are the three or four most joy-filled, not pleasure-filled, or delightful filled, but what are the three, three or four most meaningful, joy-filled events you've been at in the last 10 years? And in every case, that's say a funeral. The funeral of a really good person. And even they may have died young, you walk out of church, there may be tears in your eyes, but you know something? You're more free to live than you've ever been before. From their casket, blood and water flowed out. You know? And you're more, you know, you're more free to live, you feel less guilty, and so on. It's joy-filled. You get it when you go to a funeral of a good person and vice versa. Sometimes you go to a funeral where the casket is taking the oxygen out of the room. You know, by the way this person lived and died, you feel guilty about breathing, not alone ever having the light in your whole life. You know, see how we live, but then how we finish our death off. Like this young man who said, I want to do this right. I want to do this right. I want to show courage for my kids and so on. I did his funeral. His wife and kids walked out, they were crying, but you know, they can only think of their dad with joy, you know, they feel freer to live, they're freer people, they've lost their dad, but you see, he's left them their spirit. Let me give you one last story on this. Some years ago, I went to a funeral in our own chapel at our school. We have a huge chapel on our school, which serves for Sunday community, kind of a university chapel. <clears throat> And I went to the funeral of a woman. I didn't, know who, I didn't know her. I knew her kids. Her kids are regular members in our Sunday community and involved in our school and so on. Um, and, you know, and, the, and the kids are already married. They're not 
high school kids and so on. She died ripe old, not ripe old age, in her late 70s and so on. I didn't know her, but I knew her reputation and that she had been this incredibly wonderful woman. And she had the reputation for feeding half of San Antonio, you know. <laughs> she fed all the kids and the dogs and strays and so on. She had this big heart. She was famous for her cinnamon buns and this and baking and bread and so on. And so she had this huge, huge heart. So she died. And our chapel was full of people, upstairs, downstairs. <clears throat> and, and there was kind of a joyous atmosphere in the chapel, you know. Um, you know, it's sad, we lost her. And then at the end of the, 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 the mass, she had four daughters. And they, they announced there's going to be four eulogies, which of course sent the priests all their eyes rolling. <laughs> You're not even supposed to have one, now we're going to have four, you know. But they had choreographed as well, you know. So the first daughter went up, the oldest daughter, and she kind of gave the obituary that we have in the newspaper. You know, mom was born here, went to school here, met dad here, these are the kids, these are the grandkids, you know, these are her achievements, she's famous for her cookies and so on. Bingo, okay. So the second daughter went up and she talked about her mother's qualities. You know, she had this big heart and she was famous around the city and in the neighborhood, everybody knew, and, you know, she f basically she was a woman who fed people and she had this great heart and so on. Then the third daughter went up. This kind of maybe a lower point, <laughs> and I guess she, she didn't. Have, she didn't. She wasn't given a good script. You know, it wasn't her fault. <laughs> so the good the good lines had already been taken. So she talked about you know how her mother fed these, and even a little bit how her recipe for cinnamon buns and a few things. And this was the priests were kind of rolling their eyes by this time, you know. But then the fourth daughter went up, and she just nailed it. She just trumped it. She went up and said, you know, you've heard my three sisters speak. You all know my mother, and that's why you're here. She was a woman. She was an extraordinary woman. She had a great heart. She lived a great life, a life of unselfishness, a life that fed us, not just with bread and cinnamon buns, but a life that fed people. She said, we've lost her. She said, and I'll tell you what. She said, we haven't lost her. She said, so I want to address this now to the kids, siblings, grandkids, and the rest of you too. She said, we are burying today. This was an extraordinary woman. She was a great woman. She said, well, you don't know that yet. Especially kids and grandkids. You don't know that. She said, but she'll come to you. She'll come to you in your own time, respecting who you are and what you're doing in life, and you'll get her. You'll get who this woman was, and you'll get that she was a great woman that you were privileged to have in her life. She said, and it's a lot more than about her feeding dogs and cinnamon buns. She said, you're going to get who she is. You'll get her spirit. It's a great homily. Notice when Jesus, uh, in, in, in John's Gospel, it's interesting, in the other three Gospels, the Last Supper scene is, is one paragraph or two paragraphs. In John's Gospel, the Last Supper is over half the Gospel. Over half of John's Gospel is Jesus at the Last Supper giving this long, long farewell discourse. So he's talking about, so most of John's Gospel is Jesus speaking at the Last Supper, giving this long thing about him going away. And he keeps repeating this one motif. He said, it's better for you that I go away. He said, if I don't go away, you can't receive the Holy Spirit. Well, you want to ask why. He said, you can't receive the Holy Spirit unless I go away. And at one point he says, John adds in brackets, he says, unless I go away, you can't receive the Holy Spirit. And then John has in brackets, as of yet, there was no Holy Spirit. I always tell seminarians, put that in your ontological pipe and smoke it. Okay. <laughs> What does it mean? There wasn't any Holy Spirit. Well, no, he's not talking ontologically. The Holy Spirit exists. You can't get somebody's spirit fully until they go away. Let me talk a little bit about spirit and receiving spirit and so on. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, again, a mysterious dynamic. I talked before about activity and passivity. Sometimes we only get the real gift in passivity, which we couldn't get in activity, and sometimes we that, that transfers that sometimes we can only get somebody's real spirit in their absence and not just in their presence. Again, Henry Nouwen is the only person I've seen who's really written some literature on this. And Nouwen used to say, you know when you go to visit somebody, imagine you're visiting a sick person in the hospital. It's important that you go and visit them and it's important that you leave. <laughs> See, you bring something with your coming, you bring something with your going, you know. See, people come into our lives, it's important we welcome them, it's important that we let them go, okay? 
See, because we can only receive something from them. We receive something in their coming. The disciples received something in Jesus' active presence. They received a different and a new spirit when Jesus left. As this woman just said in, 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 this, in her eulogy, you know, you had mom when she was alive, but now you're going to get her in a different way and even a deeper way after she's dead. She'll come to you, respecting who you are, respecting what your life is like, she said, and you'll get it. You'll get her spirit. Incidentally, those of you who are parents, this is consoling. There's some bad news in this, but this is ultimately consoling. You know, sometimes parents say, you know, my kids, I don't know if they get it. They're not getting Jesus. I'm trying my best. Now I'll say, don't worry, they're going to get you. That's the good news. The bad news is you first have to die. Okay. <laughs> okay. After you die, uh, they'll get you and say, you know, mom was a great woman. Dad was a great man. This is, they had wonderful parents and so on. Uh, sometimes, you know, they get mature enough in life that they kind of realize that, but even there, they don't get the full depth until you go away. See, there's, you give something in coming, you give something in going. But you know, when Jesus says, this stuff isn't so abstract, when Jesus says, unless I go away, you won't get my spirit. Okay, what is you have to go away? Those of you who are parents, you'll have grown kids, you'll get this. Kids haven't got the vocabulary to say this, but they have to say it in their actions. But when kids reach a certain age, they have to say, Mom, Dad, it's better for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I'm always going to be your little girl or your little boy. If I go away, I can come back to you as an adult. See, you, you, you have to lose your kids to get them. You know? See, as little kids, they're yours. Um, but they're not themselves yet. They have to, they have to go away then they can come back in a much richer reality. You know, that's the way the gift of spirit works. That, um, you know, kids could say that to you, Mom, it's better for you that I go away, you know. Of course, you might say, and I'm looking forward to it too. <laughs> we were telling you that about four years ago. It's better for you that you go away. You know, but, you know, we, we only get each other when we're gone, you know. Uh, you know, my own parents, they died when I was 20, 21 in the seminary. And they died three months apart. They were both young. Dad was in six, early 60s. Mom was in her 50s and so on. And they died, you know. And initially, there was this kind of, uh, you know, I went through a couple of years grieving. You know, this, is, this was tough. You know, I'd grown up with this close family. And I said, wham, you know. You learn about the word, what the word orphan means within three months, you know. Uh, but then, within about two years, all of a sudden, a powerful strength and warmth and stuff and I thought you know I want my parents I don't need my parents anymore they've given it to me and they're giving it to me right now my parents are infinitely more present and nurturing to me now that they're gone than they ever were when they were here even though we're nurturing and so on so that's the mystery of spirit and of going away and so on see and so we have, we have to live lives in such a way that when we go away like this woman that your daughter's going to say, you're going to get her. You're going to realize mom was a great person. Dad was a great man, and so on. See that we're going to be able to give, and that's also consoling, because all of us have to leave our loved ones. We have to leave our kids at a certain point. To realize you can give more to them when you're gone than when you're here. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. Um, you know, we just had an incredible gospel, or, or first reading, two days ago. Uh, it was the story of Elijah and Elisha. Remember that story? And so Elijah is going away. Now he's, he's lucky he didn't have to die. Elijah went to heaven in a ball of flame and so on. When I was, when I was provincial, we had a, uh, this was really a colorful character, one of our priests, and he was on oxygen, permanent oxygen, carrying his oxygen tank around. But he used to like to go to the casino. And I always told him, I said, you know, you're, someone's going to torch you down there. You know, that, you know there is smoke, you know, and he says, that would be a great way to go. He said, I'll be like Elijah. Ball of fire, you know, <laughs> rising from a slot machine right to heaven. He said, from one, one, one heaven to the other. Okay, okay. But see, so Elijah's going away, and Elisha doesn't let him go. You know, he needs Elijah. And Elijah's his mentor, his leader. And so he says, give me a double portion of your spirit. I want to receive your spirit. And so Elijah, that's a symbolic thing. He puts his mantle on him, and then he disappears. It's a beautiful archetypal text, you know. See, he lays his mantle on him, and then he disappears. You know, I talked this morning about blessing. I want to come back on that. Uh, 
twice in my life. I mean, that's happened to me often with my own parents and stuff more, or people who, who have admired, who have been mentors to me, teachers, you know, um, whom I felt I received their spirit when they left. But twice it happened explicitly. Um, I don't know if you know, remember, and I'll, I'll put, I'm, I'm not shy about putting this name on a tape, because it's a beautiful story, but remember that the, he was a, a, a liturgist and pastoral theologian in the United States called Joseph Champlin. Wonderful. In fact, I think he's one of the great pastoral theologians we ever produced. Incidentally, he sold nine million books. Many of you are familiar with his book on marriage, you know, Together for Life. But this was about 2007 or 8, a couple of days before Christmas. I was in my office, and I get a phone call from his secretary. She says, are you home tomorrow, tomorrow night, at supper? I said, yeah. She said, Joseph wants to fly and have dinner with you. I had met him just twice before, once as a student and once I brought him in to speak to. Uh, uh. So I said, yeah. So the next day, I go out at the airport at 5 o'clock. I pick up Joseph Champlin, flying in from New York. And uh, he said, I need a little rest. He was already dying of cancer. And we slept for about an hour. And then we went to a good restaurant. And we had a meal. And he said, I just want to fly into San Antonio and bless you. He said, I'm dying. He said, and you're younger. And I want to just give you some of my spirit. He said, I know I taught you once and so on. Very deep move. The next morning I got up, I drove him to the airport at 5 o'clock. And less than a month later, he died. He said, I just want to bless you. He said, I'm dying. And I've come to bless you. You know, I thought of Elijah and Elisha. You know. Or another time in Edmonton, a woman who was an extraordinary woman. In fact, uh, she was a lay woman. And she was the exorcist for the diocese. She had an extraordinary faith and so on. And she was dying of cancer over a period of about 10 years. And during the last months of her life, she wrote a letter to virtually everybody she was close to. She says, come to my house. I want to bless you before I die. You know, we usually don't do that, or use that language or something that explicitly. I was living in Toronto at the time. She's in Edmonton. She said, I want you to fly to Edmonton. She said, I want to bless you before I die. So I got on an airplane at some expense, flew to Edmonton, met her at her house. She was already, she was, kind of bedridden, but not quite. She said, I baked you a cake. And so we sat and we ate the cake, or part of it. She said, I want to bless you. She said, I'm dying. She said, I don't know the ministry you're doing. She said, I've known you. She said, I want to give you my blessing. She prayed over my head. And about two weeks later, she died. You know, see, those are people who are like consciously like Elijah or Alicia. You know, they, we, we all need to do it. You know, your parents and uncles and aunts and sisters and so on. Uh, we, we need to do that. I think we're kind of always doing it non-explicitly, but as parents and stuff, and try to, to do that explicitly. You know, I think we have to risk, you know, like Joseph Chaplin, just say, I'm dying, and I want to bless you. Alicia, you know, and, cause, and we also hunger for that. The way Alicia says, I want a double portion, not just a single portion. To this woman in Edmond, that's what I said. I said, you've been an incredible woman. I said, I want a double portion. <laughs> I said, well, I'll have another piece of cake, you know. <laughs> okay. And uh, see, it, it's the mystery of leaving our spirit behind. Okay. And it's, it's the quality of how we die. Now, I want to do one last part with you about figuratively how might we do this. You know, John of the Cross. John of the Cross, who, the, 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 it's about the only literature we have on this. So how do you... I mean, we have the literature in Hinduism and Buddhism have become a sannyasin, but in Christian theology and spirituality, John of the Cross says, at a certain point, you should try to explicitly enter the dark night of the spirit. Now, how would you do that? Well, first of all, the dark night of the spirit is to give your death away. So let, let me do a fantasy with you here, okay? This is based on John of the Cross, um, but, but it's more a fantasy I'm, I'm drawing up. So I want to imagine a couple, we're going to call them John and Martha. So John and Martha are both 75 years old. They have grandkids. They're, they're, they're really healthy. They're involved in their parish. They're just they're, they're a wonderful couple you order from a catalog. <laughs> they're, just, you know, they're very Christian. They're involved. They're healthy. They're dealing with their grandkids and so on. And you're their director or mentor. And one day they come to you and they say, I want to talk to you. He said, our kids send us here. And our kids think we're crazy, and so we're going to ask you what you think. And this is why they think we're crazy. He said, you know, we're praying the Abraham and Sarah text, you know, which is quite a text. You see, when, 
when Abraham was 80 and Sarah was 70, God appeared to them. He said, I want you to leave your home and I want you to go off to a country where you don't know where you're going. And it's going to take you 20 years to get there or 10 years to get there. And then when you get there, Sarah's going to become pregnant. And she's going to be 80, you're going to be 90. And that's when you have your real child. So they do it. They set off. Abraham and Sarah, she's 70, he's 80, but it said it takes them 20 years to get, and they don't know where they're going, but eventually they end up in this land. And then now she's 90, he's 100, and she gets pregnant and produces Isaac. Now, I live in Texas. Texas say, what in the hell is that all about? <laughs> 100-year-old women don't get pregnant and so on. What is with these gray-haired pregnancies? And so on? See, that's, we don't know what happened historically. Well, something did happen historically. But this, this is archetypal. You know, now notice John and Martha said, we're praying about this, and we're going to be that. See, now we're 75, and we're healthy. And Jesus said to give everything you have, follow me radically, the rich young man, give away everything you have, give the money to the poor, and come and follow me. So we're going to do this. We're going to sell our house. We're going to give all the money to the poor, and we're buying one-way tickets to Pakistan. And we're going to become missionaries to Islam, right in the middle of ISIS, you know. And, and we're buying one-way tickets. We're not buying health insurance. We're not buying it. We're just going to get on the plane and let Jesus take care of us. And we'll land in Pakistan. And we, 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 there's no way of coming back. And we're giving all our money away. And our kids think we're crazy. And what do you think? <laughs> well, you, you would try two things. If you're an astute director, you'd say, normally it's what the direction would say. No. You know, no, don't do this. You're still needed. You're still healthy. There's so much you can do. The parish needs you. Your kids need you. The grandkids need you. You're just so healthy. You just you, There's all this thing you can do. See, you're, you might say, be generative longer. <laughs> Stay home longer. But they've done their homework. They say, no, no, we were reading this book on giving your death away. Okay. And, <laughs> and John of the Cross, and he says, no, he says, we've been generative. We've done it for 60 years. And the kids don't need us. They want us, which is wonderful. See, at a certain point, they want you, but they no longer need you. You know, um, famous missionary slogan, we live, I'm a missionary order, we always say, a missionary goes where you're wanted, where you're needed, but not wanted. And you leave when you're wanted, but not needed. You know, our parents left us when we wanted them. We didn't need them anymore. You know, besides, they say, we're going to die anyway one of these years. Everybody's going to get used to running the world without us, you know. Then you'd say, but Pakistan? You can't even spell the world Al-Qaeda. Like, what are you going to do over there? That, that's misguided, and you're going to get killed. You'll be headed on the internet, and so on. They said, no, we're trusting Jesus, and we're not going to try to make converts. We're just going to go there. And then you do the last thing. Said, but besides, like, be practical. Like, how are you going to, what are you going to do when you get off the plane in Karachi? You have no place to go. You have no money. If, what if you get sick? Well, we have medical insurance, all of this. So no, we're just going to trust Jesus. That's the whole point. Have to trust Jesus. You know? Now, suppose they did it and you couldn't stop them. What do you think their kids would say 10 years after they're dead? Our mother and dad were crazy? They'd say, no, we had extraordinary parents. We, you know, our parents, <laughs> they were extraordinary, different parents. You know? But notice what they're doing. This is a fantasy. What they're doing is they're mimicking their own deaths. See, John of the Cross would say, you know, you should do this. You know why? Because if you don't do it, it's going to be done to you. All of us are going to walk in doctor's offices, or you might not even have the luck to walk in. There's going to be a heart attack, a stroke, cancer, or something, and all of a sudden you're on the plane to Pakistan, and it's a one-way trip, and you don't know where you're going. This, how are you going to survive? It's the same with the, what's going to happen after we die? What do we do? What do we do? You know? I just heard a marvelous talk in Toronto at the Nauru Convention, this young guy called Shane Claiborne. He's just this marvelous talk. He's, he was a university student, and he somehow got a hold of Mother Teresa's phone number. And he was an evangelical in Philadelphia. He phones, and Mother Teresa answered the phone. He said, this raspy old voice. And he said, who are you? He said, I'm Mother Teresa. <laughs> he said, oh, that'll do. <laughs> he, so he said, I'd like to visit. He said, no, don't visit me. Just come. Come over and work with me. He said, well, what about eating and money and all this? He said, don't you believe in the gospel? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus feeds the sparrows, the birds. Said, Just get on an airplane. See, we're all going to have to get on an airplane going into the unknown. It's called dying. You know? And John of the Cross said what, what John and Martha would be doing, they would simply be mimicking their own death. 
you know. And he says, do it, because if you don't do it, it's going to be done to you, you know. See, now that Pakistan's an image for what this morning I call it the Sanyasan, you know, the holy old beggar. Like, um, how, how do, what does that mean for us? So that's an image. All of us, as we age, we should start looking for our own Pakistan. What does Pakistan mean to me, you know? What do I, what, and that's why we would need these forest dwelling schools who would say, Let, let's find out what Pakistan means for us. If you're, um, any of us in this room, what are we going to do with our old age? You know, how do we want to move from being generative? Remember the first objection you make to Martha and John is say, you're still needed here. There's so much you can do. Notice what you're doing. You're trying to freeze them back into generativity. They said, no, we've done that for 50 years. We've done it for 60 years. You know, we need to give our kids something else now. See, we've given our lives. Now we have to give our deaths. Now what? At a certain point, the question is no longer, what can I still do to be generative? But how can I live now that when I die, my spirit, that the blood and water flows just a little more purely and freely, and the spirit flows to the family, and so on. See, that's, that's the task for the last part of life. Um, it's a daunting task, you know, and it's what, it's, what, it's what the great mystic John of the Cross calls the dark night of the spirit. The dark night of the senses is the struggle to get your life together. The dark night of the spirit is the struggle to go to Pakistan. T.S. Eliot, home is where we start from, and a lot of that's going to be passive. You know, Jesus was passive. They put ropes around him and they let him away. We're passive in hospice. They put us in a bed. They start feeding us, giving us tubes and so on. And it's not that our life is over. That might be the most important time of your whole life. And you might be able to do something, like this woman's mother. You might be able to reconcile your family and give something to your family, your loved ones, your spouses, your children, that you can never give to all the activity and talking and so on, even though it's good. See, Jesus did two things for us. He gave his life for us through his actions. He gave his death for us through his absorption. What he absorbed in, 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 in the passivity, the passion. That's the same with us. Not, 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 not just... <coughs> You know, when the way we die, but the way we also have to die in our daily deaths, every time there's a helplessness, a powerlessness where we got to absorb something, um, it's an opportunity to give our death, you know. And every time you have an opportunity to be generous, to, to help somebody, to nurture somebody, to help your kids and so on, that's also a wonderful opportunity. You're giving them their life. You're giving your life away, you know. See, so that uh, in that way we're always giving. We're always grace-filled. You give when you can give, generativity. You give really deeply when you can't give anything, you know. When you're the one that has to be taken care of and so on, uh, then we're giving in our passivity. And our death is our ultimate passivity, our aging and our death. Just the way we diminish, you know, I tried to make it lighthearted this morning and humorous. Not that aging is very funny <laughs> that's all you know but you know there are all these diminishments and uh, uh, you know in fact I'll, I'll end with this go on the internet and find a clip by a doctor called Jack Wilson just type in Dr. Jack Wilson and um, see a talk on aging he gave it in a church in California and it's the funniest thing you've ever heard about you know the the, the unjoys of aging he does it delightful and, and, and in a very deep way. So that, that is the last part. See, we're called to get our lives together. You're all beyond that. We're called to give our lives away. That's the, that's the season virtually all of us in this room, maybe all of us are in. But that's not where we're ending. All of us are also called to give our deaths away. You know, that as we enter into the, the passivity and the diminishments of aging and then ultimately of dying, uh, we've got to find our Pakistan. And we got to do that in such a way that when, when they wheel our casket into church, blood and water is flowing from that casket. And oxygen is emitting from the casket, and the casket isn't sucking oxygen out of the room. And I think you get the metaphor. It's been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.